Welcome to the 296th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Annie Sullivan, author of the new novel, A Curse of Gold. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Annie Sullivan, author of the new novel, A Curse of Gold. Annie, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jeff. It's so good to be here. Great. If someone listening hasn't heard about your new novel, A Curse of Gold, yet, how would you describe the novel? It is a retelling about the cursed daughter of King Midas, who sets out to break the golden curse hanging over her and her father. So it's kind of just a a fun adventure story full of pirates and sirens and so many fun Greek mythology references. What was the original idea or impetus that led you to writing A Curse of Gold? Well, it all kind of started back when I was, you know, watching the movie Pirates of of the Caribbean, of all things, um, because it got me thinking about cursed gold, because in that movie, they have to go out and search for this cursed gold and bring it back piece by piece and make sure they have it all. And I was like, what if there was a different way they could have done that? Something different. So it got me thinking about cursed gold, which led to King Midas. And I was like, oh, let's think about that. And so I got to thinking about... um, about his daughter, because she's such a forgotten character in the original myth. I mean, she gets turned to gold by her father. um, But once she gets turned back into a living, breathing human being, you know, what side effects would she have? What kind of relationship would she have with her father after he turned her to gold? Um, So I really just wanted to explore her story and see where that would lead. So what kind of research did you do for writing the novel in terms of maybe rereading the myth or researching pirates? Uh, I did uh, quite a bit of research. I did a lot into Greek mythology in general. I mean, I grew up loving Greek mythology, but I really wanted to read as many versions of the myth that I could find um, because, you know, in some versions of the myth, he turns his daughter to gold and other versions he doesn't. Um, You know, sometimes the the god who gave him the gift Dionysus gave it to him just because he was spiteful sometimes he gave it to him because he helped him out um and saved one of his satyrs so like there's all these kind of different things that were floating around and and I wanted to take that and take the Greek mythology and really just play with it in a new way that's something that I love to do is to present something that you think you know and then just give it a little bit of a twist so there's always something new and different coming. Um, so you, you're always on your toes and you never know quite what to expect. And so what is the history of those myths? Is it, is it kind of like the different uh, translations of the Bible? I mean, is it just we're seeing different versions of them? Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of more like throughout the ages, people have kind of had different versions of it, um, you know, and I think it was really fun to just kind of take a look at those different ones and see what do I want to keep? What do I not want to keep? Um, because, I mean, it is a Greek myth. So I really thought it was it was important to kind of keep those Greek roots um, and really include Greek mythology. So, you know, there are sirens in there um, and there are some gorgons like Medusa in there and some different things like that um, that really do bring the story to life while paying, you know, kind of an ode to the original myth. So what are your earliest memories of writing fiction? Oh, <laughs> I definitely started out writing silly little stories. Um probably when I was in grade school. I loved just writing with my friends. We would play a game where um, we would each start a story. And then after about like five minutes, you would stop wherever you were in your story and you'd pass it to the next person and they could continue the story however they wanted. And you, of course, would get someone else's story to continue. So it might start out talking about a dentist, but then suddenly that dentist now falls into a portal and now there are dinosaurs. So you you never know what's going to happen. And so that's what I love about writing is there, there's just so much to imagine to come up with and create. Um, and I won't say that my early work was, was good. I will definitely not say that, but everybody starts somewhere. Um, and you can eventually become a published author. You just gotta keep going, keep working hard. And so what was your path to publication from that early writing to writing and getting your first novel published? It was a pretty long journey. So, um, I mean, I studied creative writing at Indiana University, and then I got a master's degree in creative writing from Butler University. And while I was at Butler, I actually wrote um, the first book in the series, A Touch of Gold. 
And that was my master's thesis, um, which I was super excited about, but I tried to query that book and no one wanted it. And so that was sad. Um, and so then I queried a different book with an agent and that book actually was the one that got me my agent, but then that book didn't sell on submission to publishers. So that was hard. Um, but then my agent said, okay, well, what else do you have? And I said, well, I've got this King Midas retelling. I think it just needs some work. And so we really revamped it, really worked on it. Um, and finally, you know, sent it out and got a publisher interested. Um, but I would say it probably took, I think I finished writing the first draft in, 2012. And then the book, the first book, A Touch of Gold, didn't come out until 2018. Um, so you can kind of see that it often can take a while to go from writing your book to getting it published. Um, so if anyone out there is a writer and is interested, just don't give up because it can happen. Um, it just it just takes time. Given given your experience and what you just described, just described, is there anything that you would have changed in your writing journey, would you have approached anything differently? Oh, yes. I, so when I was querying agents, um, I definitely was like, I'm going to query anyone and everyone and just see if, you know, if anything sticks. Um, and I think now I would have been more selective with who I queried, um, you know, knowing more about the industry now and knowing more what I want in an agent. I mean, obviously I love my agent, um, wouldn't change her for the world. Um, but just I, you know, every time I got a rejection, I was like, well, I'll just query someone else now and that'll make me feel better. Um, and I think you really just want to do more research into who are the best agents, who are the best fits for you. Um, and if you're not getting a lot of hits on your query letter, um, go back and revise that query letter or go back and work on your first 10 pages or see maybe if there's something else that you can do to, to improve your work to really get noticed. What is your creative process when writing? When you sat down to begin work on A Curse of Gold, do you work on a plot or outline and world building or did you just dive straight into the story? <laughs> um, so they kind of always say that there's two types of writers. There's the plotters who plot everything out beforehand. They know almost scene by scene what's going to happen. And there are pantsters, meaning they fly by the seat of their pants. And for better or for worse, I'm a pantster. Um, so I don't really plan out where the story is going to go. I just start writing and I see where we're going to end up. I usually know the ending ahead of time. So I know where we're heading and I might know, like if it was like, um, you know, a road trip, I might know that we're going to stop in Seattle or we're going to stop at the biggest ball of yarn. But other than that, I have no idea who we're going to meet, who's going to be there um, until it kind of happens. And I, I love that way of writing because I think if I plot too much, it, it loses its fun for me because then I know what happens. And and if I don't know what happens, then the reader doesn't know what happens either. And so the, the more excited I am to write the book, um, I think the better the writing is going to be for those who are reading it. Well, if you sit down and the words aren't flowing or you don't have an idea, do you have any tips or tricks for yourself to kind of get going? Oh, definitely. And I think that's something a lot of writers face. Um, and so a couple of things that I'll do is one, talk it out with a critique partner, you know, find someone um, who will just listen. Sometimes they don't even have to give you advice. You can just talk to them and you'll work it out in your head. Um, so that helps a lot. Um, also, it's okay to take a break, you know, walk away, maybe go for a walk or a hike, clear your head or meditate, you know, just something to kind of get away from it all. I also like to do um, what I call kind of like what if lists where I'll say, okay, what if this happened? And I'll write like 15 different things. Um, and what you kind of like do is maybe throw out the first five because those are the most obvious things and throw out the last five because those are kind of the ones that are like were stretched to write and look at those middle five and see if there's anything in there that really sounds like, OK, that's that's where I need to go in my story. Um, and it can be anything. Can, you can write the, the, the strangest things in there and just see what if what if this happened? What if to really just get the imagination flowing? Because that's that's what you need to do. Um, to get out of writer's block, which, and it can take a while. So don't beat yourself up if you have, I've had it plenty of times. And I think, especially now during the pandemic, it can be so hard to find the motivation and the time and everything else. Um, so yeah, just, you know, be easy on yourself and be gentle and give yourself a break if you need it. And I'm curious, what other writing advice would you offer for those who are writing their own stories and novels and trying to figure out how to get going? Oh, well, first and foremost, don't give up. That's like always my number one piece of advice because 
I queried over 100 literary agents. Um, and so it, at times it was, it was very depressing. I mean, you're constantly be telling, no, 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 you're not good enough. You're not good enough. I mean, even once I did have a literary agent, I had a book that got rejected um, by one publisher because they said it was too dark. And literally the next day I got a different rejection from a different publisher that said it wasn't dark enough for them. Um, so the business is subjective. So remember that. Um, so write what you love. Don't write to trends because by the time you finish writing your book and editing it and trying to find an agent or even self-publishing, whichever you prefer, um, you know, that trend is is probably already gone, you know. Um, so keep that in mind that just write what you love and what speaks to you. Um, and I think that will kind of go far. And when you are finished with one book and you're maybe querying it to try and get an agent, start writing the next one right? Don't sit there and refresh your email 20 times a day. Just start writing a new one because I knew someone, it took them 10 books to get a literary agent. Um, it took me two books to get a literary agent. Some people, it happens overnight. Everyone has a different journey. So just um, be prepared for that, I would say. Do you remember the first time you saw your first novel on a bookstore shelf? Oh. I remember the first time I saw a copy of it at a conference and that was really cool. Um, and I was, uh, I was actually all alone. I, I had gotten to this conference early and um, it was so special. I just saw copies and I was like, oh, this is my book. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I didn't cry, but I was like close. I was like, this is amazing. And actually, I just got the copies of A uh, Curse of Gold yesterday. Um, they look amazing. I am so excited. I can't even wait for them to be out in the world because they just look gorgeous. But yeah, when you walk into a store and you see that book on a shelf and you're just like, oh, that's me. I did that. Like, um, it, it's such a special feeling that I, you just can't even describe it. And as a writer, you should be able to describe it, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just such a special feeling. Great. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you enjoyed recently? Oh man. I read a lot of young adult. I just started Renegades by Marissa Meyer. And that is so cool. It's about um, a group of superheroes who are trying to like kind of save their town. Um, but you're not quite sure who's the good guys, who's the bad guys. It's, it's, it's a little, you know, misleading in there. Um, so I'm really enjoying that one. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, I love Frostblood by Ellie Blake. That's a really cool magic system. Um, and Kiss of Deception. Um, by Mary Pearson just has one of the coolest point of view twists that I've ever come across um, as a reader. So I definitely recommend that one as well. So are you working on another novel now? I am. I am. I'm working on some picture books. I'm working on some novels. Um, nothing that I'm like quite ready to share because you never know. I mean, sometimes you get really excited about something. It doesn't work. But I mean, I'm about I'm a little over halfway through, so it's it's been pretty good. It's just it's just slow right now. Like I said, I think writing right now during pandemic is it can be really hard to find that motivation in that time. Um, but one thing I do try to do is set a word goal limit where I try to write 500 words a day minimum. And sometimes getting those 500 words is you know pulling teeth, um, and other times I'll surpass it and do 3,000 words. You know. Um, but if that's something that might work, you know, for our listeners, then then definitely try it. I know other people who set a timer and they say, OK, for 46 minutes, I'm going to write. And I couldn't do that because I just watched the timer count down um, and think, well, now I have 42 minutes. Now I'm 39 minutes. <laughs> um, so for me, counting up was easier. Counting up to, oh, there's 500 words. OK, um, so that's definitely what works for me. Great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? Yeah, you can find me all over the place. I love to interact with fans. I love to answer questions. If you have writing questions, um, anything like that, you can find me um, on my website, um, AnnSullivanAuthor.com or at uh, Instagram or Twitter at A-N-N-S-U-L-L-I-V-A. I'm also on Facebook. Just Google author Annie Sullivan. Um, yeah, and please reach out to me. I'm friendly. I love to chat. So don't don't be a stranger, guys. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Annie Sullivan, author of the new novel, A Curse of Gold. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Annie, thanks for doing this interview. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. And now stay tuned for Annie Sullivan reading a selection of from her new novel, A Curse of Gold. 
Hi, this is Annie Sullivan, and I'm reading a portion of chapter one from A Curse of Gold, a sequel to my novel A Touch of Gold. And this part of the chapter, all you need to know is what happened so far, is that Royce has been reinstated as a captain in the Royal Armada. I duck through the crowd, looking for Royce again. Instead, I find Rat gathering his meal. He's actually taken one of the decorative silver platters and piled it with different cuisines. Pastries with flaky crusts filled with honey roasted nuts rest atop lightly brown fish fillets. Purple octopus tentacles dangle over the side, and every free spot is filled with grapes or olives in a variety of colors. He always has had an interesting appetite. Princess rat bows without losing a single olive from the platter. I wish I was half so good at keeping my crown steady on my head. I sigh. I've told him at least four times to call me Cora, like he did on the ship, but he never does. I think only a direct order from Royce would get him to stop using my title. Do you know where Hetty is, he asks. He scans the room, and I know if she'd been here, he would have already found her. She didn't come. She didn't want the prying eyes of the kingdom, the eyes of Lady Lucar and Lady Alonia constantly judging her, looking for hints she really was part of the gold theft, that she wanted to be the next queen. My cousin has been avoiding all appearances since the incident with Lady Alonia. She's even been avoiding me. Hetty has taken up sword fighting instead, practicing with the guards and with Rat. It seems to help some. Though I worry about her, especially since Rat will be leaving with Royce in the morning. I don't want Hetty to turn into the same outcast I was, when rumors stalking me down hallways controlled my entire existence. I want her to talk to me, but I can't force it. Every time I find some time to check in on her, she's either out practicing or pretend she's sleeping. But that doesn't hide the sniffles and sobs I sometimes catch before I knock. She's not here, I say to Rat. A flash of disappointment streaks across his face. We both thought if anything could get her out of the room, it would be the reinstatement ceremony. He groans. She'll return when she's ready. I softly touch his arm. She will. We'll make sure of it. I'll watch over her while you're gone. I resolve to check in on her more often once Rat leaves, to show her she doesn't need to keep everything locked inside. Although I half suspect she might attempt to sneak into Rat's ship before it leaves, and I'm not sure I'd stop her if that's what she wants, if that's what she thinks would help. I myself have wanted to escape from prying eyes on more than one occasion since being back. He nods. Thank you. Have you seen Royce, I ask? Rat cranes his neck around. He motions his head to the right. He's talking to some noble or another. I'm sure he'd be grateful if you rescue him. I head in the direction he indicated and find Royce surrounded by a crowd of nobles in their finery. Red jackets imprinted with black, green jackets patterned with blue wave designs, dresses in reds and pinks and whites, each with a stitched design, swirl around Royce. His head whips back and forth as they scramble to get his attention. One clasps his shoulder and asks his opinion on weather conditions for merchant ships. Another lady forces her hand into his, waiting for him to kiss it as she asks if he'll attend her dinner party next week, as if she didn't already know he's leaving tomorrow. I clear my throat. Ahem. <clears throat> Royce's eyes meet mine over the crowd. He visibly relaxes. There's a grumbling as he excuses himself from the group. He takes my hand and kisses it, suddenly a tingling up my arm. Princess. I can't help but smile. I tug Royce toward the balcony doors overlooking one of the small courtyards, not caring what the crowd thinks of our abrupt departure. The balcony is tucked away so no one can see onto it, and it's as deserted as I suspected it would be. None of the nobles want to risk missing any gossip or not being seen in their finery by the crowds. Royce loosens his shirt collar and takes off his jacket, tossing onto the balcony ledge. It was like fighting off ten temptresses at once in there. Everyone wanted to get their claws in me. Sick of being a captain already, I tease. Royce rolls his eyes and sits on the ledge next to the jacket. I've been at sea so long, I've forgotten what it's like back on land. I sit down beside him. Well, you'll have three months free of those people. A silence falls between us as the reality he's leaving sets in. I duck my head. It'll only be three months, he says quietly. It'll pass quickly. He wraps his arms around me and I rest my head on his shoulder, breathing in his scent. He doesn't smell like the open ocean anymore, just like soap and freshly laundered clothes. Are you sure? I don't risk raising my head to look at him. I'm not asking if it'll pass quickly. I'm asking if it'll only be three months, which he clearly senses. I've seen the way he stiffens around the nobles, the way he walks quickly through the palace, the way he tries to avoid drawing too much attention to himself. He takes one of my hands in his. I feel out of place here. I'm not used to all the eyes staring at me. It's not like at sea. My heart sinks. I've been dreading hearing these words since I asked my father to reinstate him. He pulls my cheek up to look at him. But Cora, 
If you can face it, then so can I. Are you sure you want to? That you want this to be your life? He takes my hand in his. Cora. He cuts off as a strange screeching noise slices through the air. I stare out over the balcony railing into the dusty courtyard clogged with carriages and horses from the nobles who'd come to watch the ceremony. Several horses throw their heads back and others stamp their feet as something glints off their bridles. A red light sparks near the closed gates built into the palace wall. It's too red and too erratic for a lantern. I'm just about to ask Royce what it is when the front gates burst apart a jumbled mess of melted and twisted metal where the lock had been. Hinges squeal as the remaining fragments are ripped from their moorings and tossed into the courtyard. They clatter to the ground, sending horses reeling. Carriage drivers leap from their seats, but instead of running to calm their animals, they scatter into the shadows. A burly man waltzes through where the gate once was. Behind him, something moves in the shadows. The man takes a quick look around, but just as the red light had drawn my eye, a slight glow of early morning sunlight hitting my skin draws his. There she is. The man points a finger as red as burning coal at me. Kill her. And that's the end of chapter one of A Curse of Gold.